Radio on WWDB, 860 AM. I'm Tom Tool. She's Sarah Timon, and we both work at the Tom Tool Sales Group at REMAX Main Line, the number one REMAX team in Pennsylvania since 2018. And after a vacation week last week, there is a lot to talk about here. We're going to be going over housing inventory jumping almost 40% compared to this time last year. The DOJ reopening their investigation in the National Association of Realtors and the 817 deadline coming up. And then we're going to talk about all this political news that's been going on and how it might impact the real estate market. So if you like what you hear, you get some value out of this, make sure to subscribe to the channel, hit the bell for notifications. And if you want to schedule a call with our team and Sarah specifically, you can do so with a link in the comments. So inventory, we're going to start there, Sarah. What, what are you seeing on the local level? I mean, obviously, like nationally, we're seeing a lot of stuff. Uh, Housing Wire published a study that said uh, inventories jumped almost 40% compared to this time last year nationally. We saw almost 17,000 new homes come to the market this past week, which to me is very welcome. How's that impacting your business? What are you seeing on the local level here as you work with buyers and sellers in the current market? Yeah, I mean, it's been exciting every day. Like when you go on seeing what new properties have popped up as well as which ones are still there, um, because you're always going to have those different um, kind of categories of buyers that want to see stuff, you know, the second it hits the market, and then you've got others that are almost waiting to make sure, you know, it makes it through that first weekend or those first couple days. Um, So I have noticed things, you know, some homes certainly are going in the first, the first couple days. Sure, yeah. um, You know, I have noticed that some are sticking around a little bit longer and that more are coming up every day. Well, and you see this nationally, right? And I think you got to look at that. There's places like Texas and Florida that have these these incredible amounts of new homes coming to the market because they were over improved. But here's what's going on locally. Uh, you look at uh, the June 2024 housing market report. This comes from Bright MLS, according to the, uh, and this is the Philadelphia metro area. So it includes a couple counties in South Jersey, northern Delaware, Chester, Delaware, Montgomery, Bucks counties, Philadelphia. The month's supply has jumped up by Point three eight months, which may not sound like a lot, but uh, what when you look at where it was, it was at one point a five nine month supply last June, and you take that point three eight that it's increased, that's a twenty three point eight percent increase uh, in the month of May. We saw a twenty seven percent increase in in what happened. So this is very telling that we're seeing more of these homes come up now. Like you said, we're still way below the norms here, but this is reason to be optimistic if you're a seller or buyer because. Most sellers need to go find a place. There, mm-hmm. I mean, not not a lot of them already have their next home lined up, and buyers obviously. What's been one of the biggest complaints? Inventory and mm-hmm. not being able to like negotiate things out. For sure, and and what we're starting to see is inventory is coming up. If you look at what's happened with price adjustments, which is reflective of negotiations, uh, price adjustments uh, in 2024, 39 percent at 38.6 to be specific, of all homes have had a price adjustment. Um, compared to this time, you know, last year we saw like 34%, 35% in 2022. And those are just ones that have adjusted, not after the sale closes, you see that it went for under the list price. Correct. Yeah, it's an adjustment to the asking price, which is really important. So that shows there's the ability to negotiate. And when when this starts to happen, I mean, you really want to look at this data and and get the word out because it's very easy, right? We talked about I'm on vacation last week. Buyers kind of like, when they get out of the market, they're not like, it's never one foot in, one foot out. It's either all in or all out. Have you seen that with some folks that maybe stop their search and aren't really aware of what's going on right now? Yeah. <clears throat> Tell us more. Um, it is, it's interesting. Like there's, <laughs> you know, you'll have clients who you are sending them stuff every day or like a couple times throughout the week kind of checking in and then all of a sudden like just kind of go off, uh, they go silent. Like mm-hmm. not really responding to anything. You're sending them like great great options and just just nothing (laughs) um so and then when they like and i've had clients there's one in particular i'm thinking of now where we've had several waves of this it's Mm -hmm. like you know they kind of hits the back burner and then all of a sudden it's like all right there's five homes that i want to get more information on and and see well and to your point about negotiating right here's some other indicators here i want to share showings are down 22 percent compared to a week ago and 24 percent (coughs) <coughs> compared to a year ago. We're seeing that median time to contracts up a couple days compared to a year ago. 
new listings are up, inventory's up, um, and then we're also seeing the number of canceled listings are up 66.7% compared to last year. Okay. That's a very interesting, and that's like a, an expired or a canceled, that's an interesting or stat. Like withdrawn. Uh, well, it's not withdrawn, so okay. it, it means they, the, the contract's over, and, and gotcha. what, that, what that means is that sellers aren't getting what they wanted, and there always was this mindset among buyers that like they're afraid to make an offer. Mm -hmm. And you've had a lot of success making offers on homes that maybe been on the market a you know a couple weeks, a couple months maybe. Talk about that that mindset of making an offer, not worried about ticking somebody off, but like we're here to do a deal because I think that's something that has gone away from the market for the past four years, five years, and now it's you know the, the most savvy agents are advising their clients to do that. Right. I mean, the only way that you are guaranteed not to get your offer accepted is by not submitting it. That, that's so, a great point. So um, I always encourage, like, even if it's, you know, below the list price or even if there are, you're including all these different inspections, um, you want to, like, I'm always a big fan of reaching out to the agent to find out, hey, like, have they rejected other offers? If so, now that this much, this much time has gone by, depending on days on market and whatnot, maybe they've would have taken the offer that mm -hmm. they had previously rejected. So getting a little bit of history on the property, what's the motivation, what's the most important thing to them? Um, is there a date that by which they like really need to have this have this sold? So um, kind of figuring out those different pieces. And then like in my opinion, on the list side, any offer in is an opportunity to that you can work with, right? Mm -hmm. So even if it's not, uh, the offer that you know that your seller would accept, I always let my clients know when I'm on the listing side, I am obligated to present every offer to you. So like, mm -hmm. you can tell me I will not accept below X dollar amount and I don't want to see this, this or this on it. I am, I am obligated to present every offer to you. So, and then kind of keeping in mind if they haven't gotten a lot of offers or, you know, if there's pieces of it that they don't like, that's an opportunity to go back and counter it. So it's, you know, getting the offer, writing the offer, in my opinion, at least puts you in the game and, you know, creates an opportunity. Well, and you mentioned something there. Every offer is an opportunity to see if something can work. Well, anytime a seller declines an offer, they're buying the home back for more than it's worth because mm -hmm. the market's going to dictate the price here no matter what happens. And we're still in a very seller-friendly market. Let's be very clear. But this is what an agent should be doing. We, we talked today at our office about what's an agent. And the, the definition is a person who acts on the behalf of another person or group. And you may be employed to represent a client in negotiations and other dealings with third parties. So that's exactly what people want when they hire an agent. And instead of just showing people around, hoping they like fall in love with the place and they just mm -hmm. have to have it, this is strategy. This is what people ask for from professionals. Right. And this market data that we're seeing inventory grow, we're seeing showings decline. All of this tells me that there's opportunity in the market to get the home that you want and even like revisiting the homes they passed on the first time. Have you ever had any success doing that? Yeah. Yeah. Where, you know, initially they were like, no. And then you go back and you take another look and it's suddenly a more appealing option. Certainly. And I think that's when you have that kind of strategy, you're there to find them what they want. And it brings up a question that I had for you is there was another article that came out on housing wire about, uh, housing demand stalling as buyers wait for lower rates because now there's this sentiment that we might see a rate cut definitely in September, maybe in uh, the, the next meeting coming up at the end of August here. Uh, the CME group, they put like uh, betting odds on this, if you will, and there, there's a Fed meeting in seven days. So it's right at the beginning of August. And there's a 97.4% chance that rates stay where they are. There's a 2.6% chance we see a rate cut. But then September is looking a lot more realistic. If you look at the September probabilities, there's a 93.6% chance that rates go down to that 500 to 525 target BIPs, which is 25 basis points below where we are now. So are, are you feeling that you know buyers are kind of waiting out the Fed? I mean, because this is, there, there's, we've seen the jump in inventory. We've seen new listings rise. Pending home sales have slowed. Prices are steady. Are, are, are you seeing demand waning or is this maybe some seasonality? I'd say maybe a little bit of seasonality. And what I've noticed is once you are, you know, in it and you're actively searching and you're motivated, knowing that there could be a price cut down the line is 
probably not going to stop you from still writing the if the right home comes up from writing the offer now. And depending on what your competition is, maybe you, you know, adjust for that a little bit. If, you know, if you think if the rates do dip, this would then be my monthly payment. OK, well, how can we get it there now with what we've got right now? If there's no if there isn't another offer, because what happens when there is a little dip mm -hmm. more buyers come back in competition and then it, it could just force it back up anyway. So, um, you know, I feel like if you're really motivated, that probably isn't something that's going to hold you back, but it's the people that are like kind of one foot in, one foot out that maybe that sounds like a great reason to wait, <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's, that's a great point. And I, I tend to agree that the most motivated people, they're, they're, never, they're never changing their mind. And, and that's, again, it comes down to good agent advice. And I, I think a lot of agents have forgotten what it's like to really be a strong agent and, and give an opinion, right? like a definitive one, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not, because how many times like you, you show people data and then you're like, what do you think? And they're like, well, what do you think, Sarah? What do you yeah. tell us? And if you don't have an answer that's like very clear and concise with some strategy behind it, they're, you're not giving them what they want. I mean, and, and that's where a lot of agents, I think, struggle a little bit because they don't understand, like they're not recapping what's happened. Like we talked about that that kind of recap on the, on the home search process. People have done this with listings constantly. Here's what we toured. Here's the market activity for those homes. Mm -hmm. It's much better than the I told you so when like, hey, this home sold for this. Yeah. Just so you know. So you get some market instead of like I told you it was going to sell for this or they made right. an offer. Right. And then what you're doing outside of that. So I, I tend to agree with you that I, I think there is some seasonality, especially in the Northeast. I mean, like mm -hmm. one sixth of the population is on vacation at any given time uh, between like the third week in June up until Labor Day. So I, I, we're definitely seeing some of that. And. I think there's a little bit of a wait and see approach to see what the Fed's going to do. And also the, the election's gotten a little crazy, right? right? I mean, the past seven days have been, we're going to hit on that in the third segment where there's an assassination attempt and a candidate stepping down. I mean, this is yeah. bananas what, yeah. what's been going on. And um, obviously, you know, very glad no one got assassinated. I mean, that's a whole other story. So th there's a lot to unpack here. So it's, I, I guess the last question I got before we wrap this up for you, Sarah, is Someone comes to you and says, I, I don't know what to do. I'm, I'm seeing this. I'm hearing this. What's your approach? And, and what advice do you have for consumers that are maybe looking for better guidance besides hiring you? I mean, we know that's like number one. But what well, it is, um, in my view, at least, or hiring someone like you or someone from our team or something like that. No, what if, me. I'm, I led with that, Sarah. It was number, yeah. number one piece of advice. So, but but all, all that in mind, people looking for guidance, like what, what advice do you have for them to, to try to navigate all this noise here? Because you're seeing housing demand stalls. That sounds very alarmist. Mm -hmm. Here, lawsuits going into effect August 17th. That's very alarmist. Prices, price cuts are, I mean, there's all this stuff. It's just all this, it, it, it can get people on edge a little bit. Right. I mean, I think trying to like just bring it back to the basics is usually like the best place to start, just finding out. Um, you know, what do they know or what have they heard and like, how does that impact? And then this is what we're seeing on our end. Um, and, you know, bringing things back to motivation and then giving them, presenting them with different options for strategies moving forward. I, I love the last thing you said, they're the options, right? I think mm -hmm. people, it, all, too often times real estate agents, and they get this reputation for a reason because people actually do this stuff. They're like, you have to do this, you yeah. have to do that. A much better approach is, hey, we've got a few options here, Sarah. Right. One is you and Eric can just walk away. We can kill this deal and, and or not make an offer mm -hmm. or not sell the house. So walking away is always an option most of the time, mm -hmm. unless you're like under an agreement of sale. Second option is we can you know try to negotiate or make an offer like we talked about. Or the third option is we can go in and pay the asking price and make sure we get the house. Right. Here's what I recommend based on these facts. Mm -hmm. What do you guys want to do? And right. it takes all the pressure out of it. So it shows you're actually on someone's side and, and going over options. I mean, there may not be all great options, but right. there's options. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, and then kind of putting the ball back in their court, you know, saying like, this is, this is what I know. And, you know, at a certain point, like I think person to person, it can really depend on how much or like how many details they want and how mm -hmm. specific they want you to be. So kind of figuring out yes. what type of conversation is going to work the best with different people and um, just kind of sharing the facts. Yeah, and, and I think that's that's what a good agent does, right? Mm -hmm. I think people tend to forget what an agent is, and, and 
in, in the past, it's like, I just hope they really like this house and they're going to move ahead on it. And that just doesn't work. I mean, it's, right. it's not what people really want when they go to hire somebody. So when I do really like the buyer weekly recap that uh, mm -hmm. we were kind of talking about earlier today, because, you know, people do have, they have different schedules. You want to be top of mind with them because you don't know how many other mm -hmm. agents they may also be talking to. Um, and kind of showing them what you're continuing to do on the back end because a lot of what we do, the client may not see, mm -hmm. you know? So uh, just kind of pointing out all the things that you're doing and also creating an opportunity for, like, do we want to make adjustments here? Do yep. we want to make changes here? Like, you know, and it, it's just a good touch point to show them that you are actively working for them even if mm -hmm. you're not seeing them face-to-face. Well, and the best business person, they never are they, they never are, are just not adjusting anything. They're looking at what's working, what's not working. We need to mm -hmm. tweak this. We need to adjust that. And they follow the data and, and the, in this case, the results for a buyer. I mean, you get a buyer or a seller that keeps doing the same thing over and over again. I think of a number of people that come to mind and it's, hey, we've tried it this way yeah. for how long? We're not getting the result that you want. Right. It's time to make an adjustment. And that, that, that may be a hard conversation. Yeah. It's a necessary one when you're making a real estate decision. Yeah. So keep an eye on this data. Inventory's climbing. There's options out there. I'm optimistic about the second half of the year for a lot of consumers. There, there's yeah. more things going on than you might realize. And we'll talk about how this election is going to affect everything in the third segment. Next, we're going to be going over the DOJ reopening their case. 817 NAR settlement deadline coming quickly and everything that's going on along the way. We're going to unpack that next on Tool Time Real Estate Radio on WWDB 860 AM. Welcome back to Tool Time Real Estate Radio on WWDB 860 AM. I'm Tom Tool. She's Sarah Time, and we both work at the Tom Tool Sales Group at REMAX Mainline, the number one REMAX team in Pennsylvania since 2018. And we are talking about the DOJ reopening their case and the 817 NAR settlement deadline for implementation approaching quickly. In the third segment, we're going to break down how the election news cycles that we are in right now, which have been incredible to say the least over the past seven, eight days, are going to impact the housing market. So if you get some value out of this, you like what you hear, do us a favor, just hit the subscribe button. It's easy to do. You can click on the bell to get notified every time we're bringing you value here. And if you want to talk about your real estate needs, and talk to Sarah, nobody else, just her. Just me. You can do it right with the link in the comments and schedule a call. So the, the DOJ and uh, NAR, this has been going on and on and on. And there was news that broke uh, last week on the 15th. We weren't here, but this is I want to cover this. Uh, the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals in D.C. denied NAR, the National Association of Realtors, the request for a rehearing of the decision allowing the DOJ to reopen its investigation into the organization. So very, I don't think this ever happened before. They came to a settlement. It was signed. It was done. And then all of a sudden, in November of 2020, the DOJ, um, after they sent that letter, agreeing to close its investigations, that's when the letter was sent in November 2020. Then July 2021, with President Biden in office, the DOJ withdrew the settlement arguing the terms put undue restrictions on regulators preventing their investigation of rules they deem harmful to consumers. Now we're here. Three years later, this is getting reopened. Are, are you surprised by this, I guess, is my first question. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm surprised. I feel like that's a, not a great precedent to set for being able to go in and just... It's not like there was new information provided or something that, like changed the the situation but um so that's not great um but <laughs> excellent analysis <laughs> you know it's and i'm also not surprised that it's three years later and it's still like just start like it takes forever for for anything to happen so <laughs> that, that is very accurate um i'm not surprised either and i i think you know, the reality of this is that a new president came in there's obviously new influence on the doj i think that had a lot to do with this i mean i'm not good bad or otherwise it's still opposition to the precedent of the interpretation of the government contracts and the bedrock principle that the government must honor its word. And now they're looking at other legal options to see if the DOJ is going to be held to the agreement. And, and this, just, this is just one more issue agents need to be prepared for, in my view. I mean, the DOJ is going to do what they're going to do. Yeah. We don't, I mean, everyone gets to vote in November, right? That's your say. That's what's going to happen. Pass yeah. that. You're in real estate. You have that, that like, there, there, you got to adjust, right? And yeah. 
what's interesting is that there was um, uh, so Bamax did a, a, a survey with uh, 1000 watt. And after the news of the settlement broke back in March, they asked a lot of questions to uh, NAR members. And it was the questions asked were, what does it mean for my business? What does this mean for my clients, especially buyers? And how do I explain the changes to consumers? And that, those were the big questions that a lot of people had. And then in the survey, if you look at how worried are you, your business, how worried about your business are you in light of the changes mandated by the NAR legal settlement that take effect in August? And they rated this 1 to 10, like 10 being extremely worried. 12.56% of people uh, said they're not worried at all. Is that your camp? Yeah. 20.67 were a 2 out of a, you know, a scale of 1 to 10. And then you saw it really drop off from extremely worried. 8, 9, and 10 was 4.61, 2.86, 3.66. So, and then in addition, only a small fraction of agents have considered leaving the industry. Um, and less than 1% of respondents decided to retire, while 16% have considered it. So I see some resilient people in the industry right now. I think that's actually pretty interesting. And, you know, when, when you see that, I, I think it's, it, it's good for consumers in a lot of ways, but it's also good for people that, like, businesses get disrupted all the time. Right. Right. And so I don't think this is anything that hasn't happened before, maybe not on this level, but I'm glad to see agents are resilient and the ones that are serious about their business mm -hmm. probably are feeling that same way. So you feel pretty optimistic here. Tell, tell us about that. I mean, well, I think when you, like, break it down, it's like there's been all of this news and all of these headlines and all of these, you know, things swirling around about this, but it, it comes down to, at the end of the day, there's two changes that are going to go into effect here mm -hmm. August 17th. As long as you're prepared for them and you know how to handle them, it, I really don't see it being a major, a major issue. Um, the, like, I'm kind of excited for the buyer agency contract, um, just because you know, over the weekend, I went out, showed a home to someone, mm -hmm. and uh, this was a situation where I was working with, uh, there was a couple that was looking to maybe buy something with their son, and they were got out it. of state, he's out of state, so I did like a, you know, went out, got everything together for the showing, did all of the comps, did all the research, did a FaceTime walkthrough, mm -hmm. and um, then sent them all of the estimated cost sheets and, you know, a bunch of additional info. And they were great. Um, they were they were fantastic. But come to find out the next day when I went to follow up that the son also was talking to someone hmm. um, and they put in an offer with him. <laughs> so it just kind of yeah. puts a level of protection there for and and forces you to have that conversation from the beginning, which you should be having anyway. And when you don't have that conversation, it often leads to things not going quite as smoothly, but it will, you know, kind of force you step one before you get out there to have the conversation about what, you know, what are my expectations from you? What are yours for me? And this is now not just me saying we need to have an agency contract to work mm -hmm. together. It's the law. Yeah. And, and I, I agree with you there. And I think it's, you know, stuff like that has happened to everybody before. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. not anything new and, and it's like, all right, what could I do differently? Well, right. This settlement's going to force people to, you know, you're going to flush out the non-serious buyers. Mm -hmm. And I, agents, one of their big frustrations is, and, and a lot of it's because of their actions. Like, it, it, And I don't want to say it's, it's not all because of the settlement, but some agents are just like, I'm going to meet you. I'm going to win you over with personality instead of yeah. like, hey, we're having a business meeting right now. Right. We're going to sit down and go over strategy, everything I'm going to do differently. And what that's going to do is I think that's going to help a lot of people. Now, what I don't like about this DOJ settlement is they're saying they need to uncouple commissions totally. Right. No, which that's going to be a pain. <laughs> well, and I mean, I, I have questions about constitutional rights here. Like, who's to say you as a seller, you're selling your house, you can't incentivize people to bring them. Like, that's someone right. saying you can't, like, that, that's a, that's like a price fixing issue. Is it, and right. it's forcing that on buyers. So I think that's where the DOJ settlement gets dangerous. And a lot of the noise we're hearing right now is, watching something on uh, Instagram about, um, you know, Ricky Carruth, you follow him? Oh, yeah. So he came out. Gonna, let me pull this up here because this is pretty interesting. Um, and, and this happened, like, on the way here. So um, he uh, posted something, just talked to the CEO of our brokerage. He's with the XP. And after August 17th, no listing agent at our company will be allowed to share their commission with the selling agent of any of their listings. What? Well, this is what, this is what they said. That's, that's been deleted since. That was a tweet. Um, then... 
he uh, posted something on Instagram. Listing agents who think they will continue to offer buyer agent commission moving forward are living in a dream world. Um, then there was something shared on Lab Coat Agents, which um, says that appears that EXP Realty change discussed earlier and removed is correct and makes total sense. So I, I think that there, there's one thought process out here that, hey, I'm going to go to sellers and tell them, hey, you don't have to pay a buyer agent anymore. And that, that's an option. That's going to be a business model for some people. Yeah. It's called for sale by owner, by the right. way, uh, to yeah. a certain extent. But now they're using an agent to market it. Now, I'm not saying that's the right strategy or the wrong strategy. That's a strategy. Now, there's also the other strategy of, hey, we want all the buyers involved. I want a great agent on the other side of the transaction. How many times has that saved you, having a good agent on the other side of these it transactions? Makes such a difference. Explain. Just, um, oh, my gosh. There's so many things throughout the process from getting under contract until settlement that potentially can go wrong, <laughs> right? Yeah. And they're even just coming down to like timelines and dates in the agreement. Like if you don't have the required documents at the right time, like that's a problem. And having to like chase people down for things mm -hmm. is a problem. <laughs> and like agents not picking up their phone can be a problem. Uh, having somebody that uh, is quick to c communicate back, knows the timelines, and also knows how to negotiate with that, like, you know, we would be negotiating things out uh, depending on the situation, but knows how to, like, explain things proper properly to their clients. So, because if the ball gets dropped in any one of those areas, it can lead to confusion and then mm -hmm. usually people being pretty upset. <laughs> Well, I'll give you an example. You probably don't even know this. So uh, Paul from our team, a killer agent, he sold a you know nice listing over the weekend. I saw the agreement come through, and it, it was not complete. Paperwork's all screwed up. Paul met the buyer in our office to get all the documents right. They had an agent. Like He, he went that far for his client, because, yeah. and that's the kind of agent and the kind of person that he is. If you know yeah. Paul Haratuni, I mean, he's, he's always doing that sort Stand of stuff. Stand-up guy. For 100%. And so... He met that person at our office, so I think that's a great example of where, you know, a bad agent caused him a lot of extra work, and it's, 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 so I, I understand the sentiment that sometimes the other agent makes it more complicated, and I, I think that's where this, this settlement and what the DOJ is talking about, I mean, it, it, it's going to be interesting, because I don't think that person is going to do well in this new environment right. come August 17th. If they find out, like, I'd be asking, what am I, if, if the buyer's paying that agent, Right. What are what are you what am I paying you for? That I'm meeting with the listing agent to get my right. documents right. Right. That's right. going to be a real question that comes up. So, and that's if there's a commission issue or not. But the DOJ saying sellers can't do this stuff. I think it's it, you know there's going to be two models out there. Actually, probably three. We're not paying any buyer agents. Mm -hmm. We're going to try to pay them, or we're going to pay them something in between of what the normal rate is. And if you're not able to have those conversations as an agent, I think you're going to be in a lot of trouble, and it's going to hurt some sellers. I mean. Yeah. I, you know, I, I just look at what happens with for sale by owners, right? You know why they don't sell a lot of times? Because agents don't want to bring their buyers. Now, you've right. sold for sale by owners. I've sold for sale by owners only on the buy side, right? And right. it's probably a little extra work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that, that it's, it, it, it gets frustrating when you're doing all this extra work for stuff. And so with that, I think you're going to, you know, the, the next six months are going to be really interesting to see how this all shakes out because it's almost like there's a script with there's this group of agents and, and Ricky Caruso, one of them, I've seen others. We're not paying. We're not going to do this. And, and I think that could, that could hurt their sellers. And yeah. then who are they going to blame? Right. I mean, there, there's a whole lot of lot of liability here. And I don't think a whole lot of people know what they're doing when they're implementing this stuff. Right. Right. I mean, I think at the end of the day, you have to think like what is in the best interest of. Mm -hmm you know, of your client and getting to settlement. And like, oftentimes, if you are the listing agent, the seller offering a, like the buyer's compensation is, that's what's effective. Like, that's what works. That's what kind of like holds everything together. Well, I look at, you know, the, the different types of listings that are out there. So say you have an, like a, an average price listing, the median sale price, average sale price in our market is around like 450, 420. Mm -hmm. That home's going to probably sell a lot easier than let's say you got a home priced at like $5 million, right? Then you sure. really need a good agent on the other side because those deals are tough to put together. Mm -hmm. Or even you go to the lower price stuff, those are also very difficult to right. put together because, and anytime you're dealing with like a first time home buyer, I mean, there, there's so many variables here that having someone that knows what they're doing on the other side, it usually makes it a win for everybody. So I, I think right. that's one concern I have about this DOJ investigation getting reopened 
But they're not the only ones scrutinizing what's happening here. There was a consumer uh, watchdog agency, the Consumer Federation of America, um, and they they basically uh, slammed the California Association of Realtors for a draft of its buyer representation agreement. And they put together a proposed criteria evaluating buyer representation agreements. And it's going to assist, apparently, regulators, consumer groups, and the industry itself to assess the fairness of new buyer agreements. And there's 15 factors that are to be considered. I think there's going to be more and more of this. I mean, the contracts are getting changed. They're probably going to get changed again. Like, it, it's, you know, th- there's a lot of problems here. And I, I, don't, I don't think anybody knows what they're doing. Right. Well, and unfortunately, it's probably going to be one of those things where you you have to work through and there will be, like, fumbles along the way and mm-hmm. then things will get revised. And um, I guess just trying to make sure that you are staying compliant with everything for however it currently stands at the time that you're, yeah. you're doing what you're doing. Um, and it's a little difficult, too, because you don't want to freak out uh, your you know, buyers Mm -hmm. or your sellers with like, hey, this could change because like people like certainty. People Mm -hmm. don't like not knowing what could be coming next. But I guess just being able to have the right conversations that things could change. (laughs) So here's some of the recommendations from the CFA. And I I don't agree with all of these. So agent compensation should be listed at the beginning of the form and clearly labeled. Love that. I think that's, I think that's, that's, that's really important. I know when we've had to do this with uh, homes that maybe weren't paying an acceptable commission, we'll have the buyer initial on the closing cost next to the, the fee that's being paid. So it's very clear. Mm-hmm. So I think that's a great change. I, I, any disagreement? Yeah, oh, no, that's fine. I figured. <laughs> um, they also re- uh, recommended that the broker and the buyer should be able to terminate the agreement at any time without a fee. What do you think about that? No, I mean, no, right? Cause like- I, I've, I've got a problem with this because... Right. Like, I mean, you can't, like, if that's written into the agreement, certainly, if you have contingencies that you are able to pull out and then you can abide by those timelines, but otherwise... This is the buyer agreement they're talking about. To wait, to pull out of what? Like a buyer agency agreement or a buyer contract. With their agent. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, you know, I think you're setting this up and you're signing a contract for a reason. You, they can, I think you can be flexible on the terms of it, but that, that exactly. has to be stated yes. at the beginning. You mm-hmm. can't just change it after the fact. Well, what, the problem there is that, um, you know, things can go wrong that are out of your control or my control. It happens all the time. And, you know, th- then a lot of, in a lot of cases, the real estate agent gets blamed. And yeah. no matter, no matter what happens, septic failed, it's your fault, Sarah. Like right. it's, and, and, and that, that happens. And the, the, I see, I see the thought process behind this because there's agents out there that don't explain anything and just throw paperwork in your face. But if you're sitting down, you're agreeing to, hey, here's what we're going to do. Here's my communication guarantee. Here's what I'm going to search for homes. I'm going over all of this with you. We're going to sign an agreement. What's the point of having a contract if you can terminate at any time? Right. I mean, that, that, and, and again, this is kind of what the DOJ is doing. So I, I, I don't agree with that. The third recommendation was that buyers should not be required to go into mediation or arbitration if there is a dispute. What do you think about that? So what would it be? You're skipping that step and then going straight to suing each other? Yeah, and, and again, I, I, I don't think that's a great idea because lawsuits cost money. Right. Um, sometimes there's ways for this to get worked out that everyone agreed to in, in, in the agreement, whether it's the buyer, the seller, whatever it is, and people just don't want to agree. So that's, the whole point of that is to enforce these contracts in a way that's low cost for the consumer. So I, I don't like that either. I, I think dispute resolution is one of the best benefits that NAR and the local boards have. So I, I tend to agree with you on this one. I think it's a, that's a bad idea. Right. And it kind of eliminates, those are, if you're going to this, uh, if you're going to mediation, the people that are medi- mediating it know, mm-hmm. like, they're very versed on the way the contract works, the way they've seen all of these situations a million times. And you're not, it's, I feel like there, it would just be more fair because otherwise you could get a better lawyer, even if you're mm-hmm. not right. You know what I mean? Well, Which lawyers, I mean, the nature of life, I guess. But, but with lawyers, I mean, I, you know, there's a lot of great lawyers out there, but sometimes one person, like, I mean, they're debating the English language at some point. And I'm like, what are we talking about here? Right. It says this and, and it gets very frustrating. Yeah. Here's some of the other points that were, were taken up. The contract's expiration date should be clearly stated. That yeah. makes a lot of sense. Disclosure of compensation is negotiable. I think that that's a, that's a great thing to have in there. Mm-hmm. Commission is due only if there's a successful closing. Now, I, I think there might be some people that start charging retainer fees. I mean, that, that that's in the new buyer agency agreement in Pennsylvania. It says there's an upfront fee. So 
you know, I mean, because people are spending time. I don't necessarily agree with that. I'm a big fan of the getting the job done model. Uh, right. But that that's something that, that's in the new Pennsylvania agreement. Um, the contract does not act as a pre-approval of dual agency. I've got no problem with that. That's got to be disclosed. Mm -hmm. Now, again, this is a different state, too, so it might be different. Um, an explanation of how a broker treats a different buyer client who is interested in the same property. I think that that's a great thing to understand. Sure. Um, and that any seller concession should go to buyers, not brokers, to use how they see fit. If compensation is listed in the contract, I don't see any issue with that either. Sure. Can, uh, and, and that you have to put it in 12-point font in plain language. That works for me. Yeah. But I, I think you're going to see more of this, right? And I, I think it's, you know, states that have been doing this for a while, like they're going to have to, like Pennsylvania has been a buyer agency state for a very long time. So I think we're in a much different spot than some of these other states that are out there. But this is more of the stuff that people are going to deal with. There's a lot of things most folks haven't even thought about when it comes to this, this settlement that, that, that's coming up. Mm -hmm. um, I got one last one here for you. And then we can, we can kind of take a quick break and talk about the election impact. What do you think happens when you can't confirm the compensation as an agent? So you can't confirm it. It's not on the MLS. The listing agent doesn't call you back. Is that, what kind of problem is that going to pose for you and your client? Yeah. So I think in that case, you would have to let your client know that it is unknown what, you know, what they would be covering and then provide them with two different cost sheets for, you know, scenario A, scenario B, and let them know these would be the extremes, I guess, mm -hmm. and that all likelihood is it would probably fall somewhere in the middle. But, um, you know, making sure they're aware of that uh prior to wanting to submit something. I, I think disclosure on your end is going to be really important. And the agents that choose not to pick up the phone or have systems in place to communicate this, they're going to have a lot of problems because I'd be blowing up the broker's phone at that point. I'd yeah. be emailing everybody. And, and I think I would be automatically putting in with the document submitted that the seller is paying the full amount and then kind of putting it back on them to come back and like have that. Mm -hmm. discuss, you know what I mean? I don't. Yeah. It I, just it creates a lot of extra phone calls and a lot of yes. a lot of extra time and um yeah. And like the last thing that you want to look or like to your clients who are buyers, you don't want to have commission breath or act like you're just after, you know, whatever. But mm -hmm. this is our job and like we sh are to be paid for doing our job. So um yep. I guess just being clear about that from the beginning is the best way to tackle it. Yeah. And I, I think what's going to happen here is that these agents that, and you know, I, I like there's systems in place. Like we've got a system all designed, like we're, we're, you know, to communicate this in compliance with the settlement. Like it's all, it's all thought out. We've got it planned out. You, you got to kind of just follow the system. Like it's like when people read the instruction of offers and they don't follow any of them and right. they like, it, it just, you know, agents are going to have to do a little more homework on their end. Mm -hmm. And I think that's another unintended consequence here that a lot of people aren't talking about. So the best advice I have is is either, one, get educated about this real quick if you don't know what's going on. I mean, how long have we been talking about this? A year? Yeah, At least. While. Yeah. So, and if you're not in an environment that's focusing on this, you might need to think about, you know, moving somewhere else because th this is going to change things dramatically. And you don't want, like, a lot of extra work just because some people aren't doing their job. Right. Any advice you got, Sarah? Answer your phone. <laughs> Answer your phone. I like it. All right. We're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back, talk about how the election uh, news cycle, because there's been a lot of it, might impact the housing market as we head into the fall. Next on Tool Time Real Estate Radio on WWDB 860 AM. All right, all right. We are back on Tool Time Real Estate Radio on WWDB 860 AM. I'm Tom Tool. She's Sarah Timon. And we both work at the Tom Tool Sales Group at REMAX Mainline, the number one REMAX team in Pennsylvania since 2018. And we're going to be talking about how the election is going to affect the housing market here. There's been some incredible news that's happened between the assassination attempt on former President Trump, President Biden dropping out of the race the first time a candidate has done that since 1968. H have any clients like brought this stuff up to you? I mean, we saw the market rally after both of these events, which I don't know how I feel about that. That's what happened. Um, obviously, you know, glad no one got killed. I think that's a, that's a whole other thing. I mean, I've Never thought we'd see something like that in our lifetime. But, uh, right. so I mean, have, have you? Is, are people starting to worry about the election? Because this is about to go pretty crazy here. So, to be honest, from actual, like, active people that are looking or thinking about selling, I haven't, I really haven't had it come up a ton yet. Where I have heard it sometimes is just if you're at, like, you know, the family barbecue. And then, okay. you know, you're 
so and so just asks, oh, so how's you know how's everything going? How's real estate? How's the election impact? You know what I mean? It's more like people that aren't actually mm -hmm. that I like so far. That's kind of the people that have brought it up to me. Got it. And I, I think it's going to be like you said, Sarah. It's not going to be so much the people that are like out there in the process of doing this stuff right now. I think it's the people that are thinking about right. doing something in the future yeah. and. You know, that's where, you know, uh, and, you know, as, as a real estate agent, your money is made by, you know, doing something that's going to pay off in like 90 to 120 days. That, mm -hmm. That's the reality. So um, what what I, I tend to agree with you. And when you look at this here, I mean, it's there, there's uncertainty. Right. And I think uncertainty creates worry. And here's the, the data I'm going to share. Um, this comes from Keeping Current Matters and, and NAR. So the last eight presidential elections, seven of the eight. Home prices went up after the election. So in 2020 to 2021, we saw prices go up from 296 700 to 350 700 so $54,000 from 2016 to 2017. And that was obviously like COVID fuel. There's a lot in there. Mm -hmm. 2016 to 2017, we saw prices go from 235 5 to 248.8. 2012 to 2013, 177.2 to 197.4. Uh, 2008 to 2009 was the only time we saw prices go down, and obviously that was in the middle of like a financial meltdown. Right. That's the only one of all those elections dating back to 1992. The other piece of news here, and, and really data, I shouldn't say news, is that home sales went up during nine out of the last 11 presidential elections. So most recently, uh, 2020 to 2021, we saw home sales jump up 5.64 million to 6.12. 16 to 17, 5.45 to 5.51, 2012 to 2013, 4.66 million to 5.09 million. Uh, the only times we saw the number of home sales drop was 1988 to 1989 and 1980 to 1981. That's out of the last 11 elections. So what that tells me is that I think there's opportunity out there for the people that are thinking about transacting maybe like Q3, Q4. Right. Or Q1, because I think this is going to, the election's in November, right? So the hype's going to happen mm -hmm. September, October. Like, I don't even want to watch TV then with all the political ads that are on. Like, it's, it's the nice yeah. thing about streaming television, right? right but if yeah. you watch live TV, it's a problem. I, I would argue that there's probably more opportunity to get, um, to find the home that you want, for because the, there's going to be some buyers that hesitate, mm -hmm. and, you know, get your home sold, because there's not going to be a lot of people on the market, even though inventory is rising. I think we're going to see, if you look at the data here, Looks like home sales jump up after the election the following year. Right. So I see opportunity in Q3, Q4. What, what, what do you anticipate here after looking at this data? Well, I mean, it kind of seems like the trajectory, with the exception of, like, 09, is that it just goes up regardless of if there is an election or not, right? Like, because well, I guess it's only giving you the info for the election years. It's not, like, mm -hmm. piecing in the other the other Presidential years. election. It's not all the midterms but, yeah, and all yeah, that yeah. stuff. Presidential. So, um, I mean, I think that's kind of the general direction that things will be heading regardless and that whether or not there is a presidential election, mm -hmm. you probably still need to move forward with your plans. Um, but I guess, yeah, there will, I'm like, certainly I think there will be some people that as everything's like shaking out, like mm -hmm. in like the end of Q3 or like, I guess more like Q4, um, they're they're going to be holding back in the months leading up to that. So it would be, if you're motivated and you're ready to go, you're probably going to have more opportunity now than later. I, I tend to agree. And, and I think, you know, you always look at what Warren Buffett says, where you want to be, you know, transacting when other people aren't. Like, you never want to be the, like, selling when everyone's selling or buying mm -hmm. when everyone's buying. And when there's hesitation in the market, you know, we talked about this before that, I mean, even during like that, that stretch in 2020, there was a couple deals to be had, like it, like right at the end of the pandemic before people kind of got out there. And, you know, that, that you have to look at like supply, you have to look at interest rates. Um, those are going to have a much bigger impact than the presidential election. And even if like there's some grand housing plan, right, like President Biden came out and they have that plan to like add, you know, two million housing units and all this other stuff. You know how long that takes? Right. Years. Yeah. And so I wouldn't let any of this affect your plans. The data backs it up. That's what we wanted to share with everyone here so you can make a well-informed decision. That's it for this week's episode. You want to follow Sarah. She's at Ty underscore Ty Time on Instagram. You can follow me at TomTool3RD. You want to schedule a call with our team and talk about real estate and how to navigate the election or anything else we talked about. You can do that with the link in the comments to connect with myself and Sarah. 
and we're streaming live every single week on YouTube. If you like what you hear, click on the bell for notifications, subscribe to the channel, and we'll be back next week on Tool Time Real Estate Radio on WWDB 860 AM. Thank you.